Hello and welcome. This is Agile Hardware Design, CSE 293 for the winter 2022 quarter. Here we are today in our first session. This course is, of course, scheduled to be in person, but we are remote for the first two weeks, so here we are. All of these lectures will be posted publicly on YouTube. However, the students in the call, you guys will not be included, so there will be pauses in the recording. You may hear me repeat questions to try to make it more clear for those listening in the future. So, uh, what are we doing today? Well, I'm going to try my best to motivate why we're doing this course, why I should take this course, why this is an exciting topic. Uh, and then, of course, get you really excited about Agile hardware design. And then conclude by covering typical logistics stuff about how this course is going to work. So, uh, taking a step back, let's kind of envision the bigger space of things we're dealing with right now, right? So, we're in a world where there's a zillion electronic devices around us, right? You know, 10 years ago, yes, we had smartphones, and yeah, there were data centers, but... You know, maybe that was kind of it. And now we're in a situation where perhaps maybe due to having like a, a watch or other things, you may have multiple electronics with you basically 24 hours a day. And it's not just on you and your person, it's around you and your world, right? And so this is not just Internet of Things, this is high performance embedded, like, you know, self-driving cars and such. The amount of electronics out there in the world is continuing to growing by a tremendous rate. So good, that should mean we all get jobs, right? Uh, well, there's some, there's some caveats to that, right? Um, so one thing you may have heard about in your other hardware courses is what's going on with transistor scaling. So as a brief reminder, of course, uh, you know, many of these great things we'll do with electronics have all been enabled by uh, transistor scaling, right? That is that what you could do before, uh, we can now either do cheaper, and what you couldn't do before, now we can do. And the reason why is, quite bluntly, we had more transistors. With more transistors, we could get more done and thus do cooler things. Or if they got cheaper, we could do the same thing for less. And so Moore's law was this uh, empirical observation that the cost effectiveness of transistors uh, decreased every two years by a factor of two, which is a big deal, uh, and that held for decades. Uh, that's been slowing down. Uh, also problematic is the NARD scaling. So with you make transistors smaller and smaller, they're faster, they take less energy, that's all good. But it's not half the energy, right? So if you double the transistors in your design, and you don't decrease the energy by a factor of two as well, the amount of energy it's going to take is actually going to uh, increase. And so as a result for us hardware designers, this has led to the need for specialization. That is that even though we're getting more and more transistors, they are uh, not quite as energy efficient as we'd like them to be. And so as a result, we need to make our designs more specialized. By making our designs more specialized, more custom tailored to the application we're doing, we're more able to... Um, uh, to get the efficiency gains we need, right? So kind of recap that bullet point, we're trying to say that due to current transistor scaling challenges, right, we're in this world where we need uh, more specialized designs, kind of more carefully done for each thing. General purpose CPUs may not cut up everything because they won't be quite as efficient as we need, right? If we want to do this super low energy, deep learning thing on the fly, we maybe we'll need specialized hardware for that. So that's the need for hardware design, but what's it like in practice? Well, uh, at the same time, unfortunately, the cost to do hardware design is actually increasing. So this is not a good situation, right? So why is it increasing? Well, uh, as we get more and more advanced technology nodes, transistors are smaller and smaller. They have more and more complicated physical constraints. And so that's more to design. But also, we actually are designing bigger things, right? If you design a 2 billion transistor chip one year, and the next year you try to do a 4 billion transistor chip, which, you know, hopefully you could do with Moore's Law, that's twice as many transistors. That's twice as many things to design, place, uh, and verify, right? Make sure you get the right thing. And so uh, design costs are rising. And so this becomes problematic where uh, you want to design, uh, you know, your new spiffy chip specialized for your application you really care about. However, uh, you find that, oh, wait, uh, the costs are really expensive and I can't afford to do this in a leading process technology. I need to do this in a, you know, five-year-old technology to make it more affordable, and well, five-year-old technology is not as good. So there's going to be some, some, some loss there, right? And so this is kind of simultaneous double whammy is hurting us as a field, right? Where we, on one hand, we have this need for more specialization, more hardware designs. We want to design a lot more. And on the other hand, uh, it's more and more expensive to design, right? Uh, and so how are we make this happen, right? This is tricky. Uh, and so this is actually a really big problem, right? Because this Rising design costs could derail this whole thing. Uh, it's actually the 2018 Turing Award lecture uh, titled uh, The Golden Age for Computer Architecture, which is talking about this wonderful future where we have this clear need for specialization and all these applications. So 
we're gonna have more hardware design than ever and it'll be great. Unfortunately, that whole dream could be derailed uh, by hardware design costs. It's a really, really pressing big issue, right? And so uh, I keep saying the term hardware design, understand the back of your minds that design doesn't just mean making the thing the first time. It means uh, making it and testing it in particular, verifying and making sure it's the right thing. That's actually a large part of the, the effort. Um, okay, so I said, so we just problem where we want to design more hardware, expensive to do so. So that's really, it's important that we find a way to make design more effective, cheaper, et cetera. So that's, that's really the whole goal of not just this course, but a large fraction of the industry is trying to solve this problem. How do we make design more cost effective so we actually can go how about designing all these things? So um, that kind of sets the stage. And now to kind of set the stage a bit further in terms of when I keep saying agile, what am I talking about? Uh, I'm going to kind of make these caricatures of two different design philosophies. And I won't decide these are characters where you look at things in practice. They may not be quite uh, so stark, but this gets the idea across, right? So uh, a classic design method you might refer to as a waterfall design. Uh, what that means is you do one step completely before moving on to the next step. And so a great analogy for this is something like, uh, you know, civil engineers building things. Uh, you know, for years, people were building things and when things fall down, they don't want that to happen again. They work really, really hard to prevent that from happening again. It's really important, you know, the bridge or dam does not fail. And so civil engineering has developed all these techniques to make sure things work. They have all this careful planning and modeling and testing. And guess what? Fortunately, in the modern world, you know, these catastrophic failures are pretty rare. Um, the same could not be said for software or hardware. Uh, and so we as, you know, aspiring engineers in computer science, computer engineering, we keep saying, okay, we need to do things more like civil engineers, right? We want to have very careful planning and testing and all this kind of thing. And that's the way we're going to be real engineers and make things robust. Um, and if you think about how that kind of philosophy comes out, right, you know, it's like you're building a dam. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to carefully design and model your dam. And then when it comes time, you're actually going to, you know, make these forms and molds before you start pulling, you know, uh, millions of gallons of concrete. And the reason why you go through all this effort is it's a large physical thing, right? That if you're going to pour all this concrete, you only want to do that once, right? You don't want to pour all the concrete and decide, you know what? Maybe I wish that was a foot to the left. Uh, that's not going to be too tractable or too easy to do. Uh, and so you, you really want to get it right once, right? And the reason why is because you're building this large physical thing. You, you really can't uh, kind of easily change it, right? Um, so that makes sense for large physical things. There is a alternative uh, philosophy uh, referred to as Agile, which of course, you know, caught on the software community and kind of takes this different mentality, right? And it says, you know what? I can't know the perfect design in advance, right? I can try my best to picture it, think about it, model it, simulate it, whatever. But the reality is until they start actually building things, it's not going to be perfectly clear uh, what the right thing is. Um, now, this is really clear in the software case, right? Because you can imagine where, you know, until you start working with users and seeing how things work and how the UI is used and kind of the emergent behavior, it's hard to know that in advance. Uh, in hardware design, I argue it's the same thing, right? Where even if maybe we don't have quite the same sort of notion of users, when it comes to actually building things and finding out what they cost in hardware, uh, it's sometimes really hard to know all that in advance. And so it's kind of agile philosophies are going to kind of continuously look at things and reassess and adapt, right? So perhaps a uh, better uh, analogy for an agile process is imagine like a competitive athlete from sort of sport, right? Where uh, you do your best to prepare, you, uh, you know, you train, you practice. It's a team sport. You practice with your teammates. You guys have set strategies. You do all of that. Um, but at the end of the day, you can only do so much, right? Uh, you know, when it comes to actual competition, you're competing against an opponent, your opponent may do different things. And it's important that you adjust your strategy on the fly to adapt to them, right? Uh, and so that's the kind of thing. So think of yourself as kind of being nimble and ready to adapt, right? So there's kind of these two contrasting philosophies. And as I said, these are kind of, you know, exaggerated caricatures, but I guess the idea across, right? Or waterfall, we're going to be very careful and try and plan everything out in advance versus an agile, we're going to be uh, ready to kind of respond and adapt and kind of iteratively improve. Uh, okay. So uh, taking that same, uh, you know, distinction and translating this to actual hardware design steps, you can imagine if you're doing a waterfall star style hardware design, you might do something where you would, for example, uh, initially um, design the hardware. Okay. Then you specify, give these documents, you know, pass them out to various design teams to go about implementing it. 
And of course, they're going to go out and internally test their block. Okay, yes, I built the block that does function X. It meets, you know, Y area constraints. It's within the Z power budget. You know, I did my job. Pass it on to the next team. They're going to integrate all these blocks together. And then, uh, you know, after you integrate all these blocks together, even though they met their individual specs, you may find out that you need to optimize it some more as an entire thing. You know, your entire product as a whole is not making its budget. So you got to tell every team, okay, I need you to get 10% faster in your block. And they all try to make 10% faster in their block. And, oh, yeah, you also got to verify this whole thing. So uh, going through these steps like this is kind of very waterfall manner. And in some companies, it's actually kind of like a pipeline style philosophy where you have, you know, a verification team that, uh, touch the design after the physical design team, right? For example, it's kind of being passed in pipeline fashion. Where initially, someone's kind of specking it out, someone's building it, someone's optimizing, making it physically uh, manifested, and someone's actually testing and verifying it. So it's kind of get everything right before we move on to the next step kind of mentality. Versus the Agile is kind of this continuous feedback loop, right? Where you want to start integrating things as early as you can, start optimizing things as early as you can, and start... Um, uh, verifying as early as you can, get all these things going. And well, how can all these things going so early? Well, the secret is you don't complete the entire design, every last function, every last bell whistle. You get the minimum viable thing running just to kind of get a sense and then kind of start fleshing it out and filling it in. Um, what's nice about this is you can actually learn a lot from it. Uh, when you start with a hardware design, uh, let's say you start a decision design and get the final product that's verified and designed out the other end. You may learn a lot of things about that problem and how to solve that problem, right? It turns out when I'm trying to build this kind of application in hardware, I need to do the following things or I shouldn't do the following things. And so as a result, uh, if you did it a second time, you might do it a little differently, right? And guess what? Well, sometimes how these waterfall designs work in practice is if you make a product every year and you're kind of continuously improving it every year, you do get a chance to do that where you make a design one year and it's going through the pipeline of the rest of the design teams doing their work. And then you make another design next year and you kind of take into consideration what you learned from your last design, right? Well, the Agile approach, you're going to learn a lot more often, right? You, you run the ground this loop more times. And the more times you get around this loop, the more times you have a design and see what it looks like at the other end, the more you can kind of keep tweaking that design and keep tweaking what you're doing, the better understand what's going on. So you keep hearing me use this phrase, the loop, or go around the loop, close the loop in this course. What I'm referring to when I say the loop is this, this process of... Um, taking a design in and, uh, you know, going through the various phases of your design process and then seeing something that looks almost like the final thing. Now, it may not be feature complete, but you are getting it close to the other end in terms of seeing what, what it might it cost physically in terms of, you know, area, power, performance, or, you know, uh, making sure to start getting verification going as well. I'm going to pause right here because I've been talking for quite a bit. So maybe I'll make sure people, so people understand they can ask me questions. Feel free to Raise hands or chat in the Zoom or to speak up, honestly. It's just a small class. Uh, okay, cool. All right, students seem okay. I'll still keep a quick breather, though. Great. All right, well, let's, let's keep going. Welcome. All right, so, uh, yeah. So, okay, so we kind of have these contrasting philosophies between Waterfall and Agile, and I'm arguing that Waterfall is kind of the, the current practice and Agile is kind of this next generation of approaches that we're trying to make more common. Uh, but as I said, you know, if you look at inside a lot of companies, even though they promote this at waterfall style internally, that there's some there's some amount of agileness to it, right? And so the whole point of this course is to really kind of embrace this and fully recognize this and go forward with gusto, right? So um, what makes agile possible or worthwhile? Well, as I said, the, the biggest tenet, the biggest premise is that we can't know what we want to build in advance, right? If you're building a dam you know where it's going to go. You know how much water it's going to hold. You can figure it out in advance, right? You can try your best to predict what is going to be the worst earthquake in 100 or 500 years, what's the worst flood in 500 years, and design those city margins. You can do all that, right? But when it comes to designing a harder block, especially something that's new, uh, some of these things may not be obvious in advance, right? For example, if you're worried about performance, what will be the timing critical path? That may not be obvious. Uh, you know, maybe if you're designing the processor and you're taking last year's design, you're tweaking it to make it faster this year, you might have a hunch where the critical path's going to be, right? It might be the same place it was last year. Maybe it was the second slowest path from last year and you know you added something to it, so it's going to be slower this year. You have a chance, right? But from a totally novel new design, you're trying to build newer specialized things, you may not know where it is in advance. You may not even know what it's going to be in advance. And so um, it's hard to imagine that, right? And the more you kind of embrace these agile philosophies, the more you almost kind of start to take a bit of a version of somebody trying to tell you they could plan this out in advance, where it almost seems uh, 
comically arrogant that somebody thinks they could take a brand new hardware block that's never before been built and tell you what its clock frequency is going to be and what a critical path is going to be. That's, yeah, it seems so unbelievably arrogant, right? And so recognize that. You don't know what a critical path is going to be. You can try and guess. You have some hunches, but you're going to see where it is, and then you're going to adapt and go based on that, right? And then even if you, you know, timing issues aside, uh, when it comes to your design, how well is it going to map to a given implementation technology? Maybe when you first start off in your design process, you guys are targeting an FBGA. And after, you know, some choices are made and you start seeing numbers, you realize you're not going to reach your, you know, power performance and area targets uh, with FPGA. So you have to change over to ASIC and go through the process again, right? And so it'd be great to model and predict some of these things, but some of these things you can't know exactly. It's not to the precision you'd like until you actually start doing it, right? And this is just with regards to uh, design itself. But then, as I said, verification is a major concern. That is, how do you get the right how do you convince yourself you built the right hardware and test it and make sure it's the right hardware um such so actually sorry excuse me i should clarify there's verification and validation verification is does the hardware do what i think it should do and validation is did i build the right thing so in other words verification will have some sort of specification and i say hardware does this specification validation is making sure that not only is the hardware behaving correctly but is the specification right as well am i actually doing the right thing um but both of those are important. Both of those are very time-consuming. And guess what? Since they're so time-consuming, you wonder, maybe is there a way I could change my design? Perhaps not at any expense to performance power area that could make verification easier? That would be great. That would be very much worth doing. And so we should consider that and talk about that. Um, uh, is there a question? Yeah, so, so this is a fantastic question from, from the Zoom. I'm going to try my best to capture for everyone else in the recording. Uh, so the first question was, uh, so I'm breaking into two questions. Uh, how would this be, is this best for CPU, GPU, other types of hardware designs? Uh, my argument would be yes, all of them. I think you get the biggest benefit for a brand new hardware design. So if you're going for something that you've never built before, uh, the agile approach I think is going to be extra effective there, right? Because you don't know what to expect, right? Now, as the uh, questioner very astutely pointed out that, you know what, if you're a CPU design company and you have last year's CPU design, you aren't starting from scratch, right? And so you, you do know some of these answers to some extent. You know probably what a critical path might be if you don't change things too much. And so you have some hunches about these things. Um, and so the way I'd respond to that is in some ways, they're almost doing like slow motion agile, right? <laughs> By having design from last year and knowing the outcomes of last year's design, they know what some of these things are going to cost in terms of power performance and area. They know where the certain issues are and the certain challenges are. And so that's very valuable information, right? Uh, and so it'd be great to have the information, get access to that information quicker, right? So rather than having to go through a multi-year design process to get that information uh, and then change the design next year. So, you know, only you only make these changes once every you know, two years every time making a new design, that's a very long feedback loop, right? And if you can tighten up that feedback loop and go through that loop more times, perhaps you can better optimize this kind of idea into which the goal for Agile, right? Where, you know, if I have a hard design, okay, so I last design here to things that are right, here to things that are wrong, and I'm gonna change it for this year's design, great. But what if I, instead of doing it one time through loop per year, if I can do it, you know, a dozen times through loop per year, right? You know. It's not easy to get through all the various stages of the hardware design, right? You know, you have all these very physical design challenges, all these verification challenges. The more of this you can automate and the more you can do it more often, uh, the better, right? You could get much more nimble, much more responsiveness to what's actually happening in design. So 
Uh, yeah, I think that's a very good question bringing up. Yes, you know, industry doesn't always start from scratch. If they have a previous design, I would argue it's almost like, like I said, it's like slow motion agile, right? Where they, they have the design, it's their, their design process is being directed and guided uh, by prior results. But the goal is really to kind of try and speed up that design loop, get through that loop faster so you can do more iterations and get more feedback and more quickly respond to it. So hopefully that, I think, covers the questions. But yeah, those are great questions. Um, and so yeah, so you can see this is kind of, at this point, it's very philosophical. We'll get into more concrete things as this quarter goes on. Um, but let's, you know, kind of appreciate the context, right? So Agile is kind of already like a given in software, right? Now, if you go search for it online, you're going to find a bunch of courses and books and they have a variety of things. So, oh yes, you must do X, Y, and Z in order to be Agile, right? And some of these things include like, you must have these daily Scrum meetings, or perhaps you need to use some sort of productivity tracking software and talk about, you know, developer velocity and all these things. I would, you know, zoom out, ignore those details, right? The big picture is uh, kind of this incremental iterative improvement style to design, right? Rather than, you know, going off and writing the entire thing all at once, um, try and get everything integrated early and go from there, right? So for me too young to remember, there was some colossal uh, software failures in the late uh, 1990s where companies went on very ambitious projects such as, you know, designing entirely new operating systems for themselves back when that was something people still thought they could do. And um, guess what? Uh, there was, you know, comically behind schedule, years behind schedule doesn't work. It was buggy, all these issues. It was not too big of an undertaking, but this waterfall approach, we're gonna build all these subsystems and put them together and all of a sudden, bang, we have a user OS. Um, that, that was just not gonna work, right? And for example, if you contrast this to something like Linux, Linux didn't start big, right? Linux started really small <laughs> by mostly one person <laughs> and over, you know, 30 years, it's been incrementally uh, added on to and grown. And to where it is today, it's you know extremely useful and its changes have been mostly guided by need and by use, right? Um, and that's kind of the point. This, it actually arguably was already kind of taking an agile philosophy, right? You know, taking this, uh, get something working today and then make it even better tomorrow, right? But uh, a little bit of advanced design is good. A little advanced planning is good, but don't be afraid to kind of revise and iterate, right? And so that's kind of, Really, what I'm really hoping to have conveyed to you folks in this course is to view hardware design in this way, right? I think for software, it's it's a given, right? We're kind of used to getting mockups. You may have heard this, you know, MVP or minimum viable product is a common term. Um, and so, given those kind of mentalities, it's it's already won by hands down in software. I'm trying to bring this to hardware, right? Think of hardware as simply being very stagnant, very slow, very uh, you know, process. Get it more iterative, get it more ad agile, and that's kind of thing. And you ask yourself, well, why is this change happening now? What's the big difference? I argue one of the key factors powering this is the emergence of new hardware design languages and better hardware design tools. Uh, if you've ever written Verilog or anything like it, uh, I like to think of Verilog as like pouring concrete, where if you have Verilog that does the right thing and it's verified, that is tough, right? That is definitely going to run well through the CAD tools, right? You know, it's going to get you correct hardware. It could last forever. There's Verilog older than me. People probably still be running Verilog after I die, right? I mean, correct Verilog that does the right thing and it meets the certain goals, that, that, that definitely will last. The problem is it's really hard to get to that point, right? Um, it takes so much person effort to get to that point, to get to the right thing, to get it properly designed. Uh, it's just, yeah, Nessa's word is kind of rising that cost come from, right? Not just writing it, but verifying it and convincing yourself is correct, right? And so because of that, you know, people are really careful before they go through that big effort to make sure they're, they're building something they want, which is why, you know, you kind of have this waterfall approach of, you know, making sure the blocks I'm building are the blocks I want and they're going to fit together, right? Because you got to really worry about this. If you have a more forgiving, more flexible tool flow in languages, and it's not so hard to rerun your verification suite to rerun through the physical design process because it's mostly automated, um, then you're a little bit less afraid to kind of make changes on the way, right? Because I said, if you think it is pouring concrete, you got to get the mold just right and then pour it once and leave it alone. Yeah, of course you want to be really careful to plan it. But if instead it's kind of something you can have more like clay and kind of keep modeling and reshaping much more easily, um, you can, right? And so that's kind of what the whole point is, of course, taking advantage of these newer tools, newer languages to go about kind of taking that more nimble approach. So I'm going to pause for a second. I think I just saw a chat go by. Uh, oh, yes, there's a great quote. Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, so a great question from Chad is, you know, I understand that Verilog can be hard to write, but, you know, why couldn't it be, you know, modular and wouldn't it be easier to reuse if it's uh, modular? Um, the answer is Verilog can be made modular. However, in practice, uh, sometimes, depending on the interfaces and the capabilities of the hardware block, it can be hard to reuse. So when it comes to the issue, I believe, in perhaps the next slide? Let's find out. Uh, no, in two slides. So I'll come to that. I'll come back to the issue. So if I don't answer that in two slides, then please ask that question again. <laughs> um, okay, so here we are kind of, you know, espousing this in an agile philosophy, and we're saying the kind of key thing about this making agile possible for hardware is that, you know what, we have these newer tools and these languages. We can automate more of these steps. And so rather than having it be, oh my gosh, you want to, you know, re-verify things, you have to have all these humans do all these things. No, instead it's automated. The tools can just run again. Uh, and thus, if the tools are just running again, I can do it more times and learn more and adapt more. Uh, you know, it's kind of like imagine you're playing some sort of, you know, board game, right? You know, your first time you have one strategy, you play that board game 10 times, you hopefully will get better at it, right? It's almost like a form of reinforcement learning. And so it's the same thing where you as designers are going through reinforcement learning about how to solve this freaking problem, right? And so the more times you can get through this loop, the more times you can get through it, uh, the better job you can do, hopefully. Okay, and so to kind of put a bow on this, what are the main goals or benefits for agile hardware design? Uh, the biggest one is the first one, right? I keep talking about let's reduce designer effort, right? And um, part of the reason why the agile approach is so good at this is that not only do these newer tools and new languages take less work, but um, by being guided in what your efforts are, you know what you need, right? It may turn out that a certain hardware block um, doesn't need to be optimized, right? Uh, better yet, it's actually better you don't spend your time doing that because there's actually be a lot of work to optimize that. And so instead of being able to alone, that would be great. Uh, and so by kind of integrating things early and seeing how things are fitting together and realizing, oh wait, this whole thing's off the critical path, then I should do something here that just makes it, you know, easy to verify and be done with it. That's great information to learn, right? Um, but as I keep talking about, right, by going through this loop more times, you can improve the result. You can better know where to optimize, how to change things. Um, and so effectively, you're doing profile guidelines in your hardware design, right? Where instead of having kind of only one shot where, you know, you design in, in advance as best you can for models and then build the blocks, put them together and hope it's a good result. No, you can integrate it, see the entire result and go, oh, wait, no, this portion of design is really holding us back. Let's see what we can do over there and really kind of guide your efforts for development. Um, and then finally is the one that's nice is increased predictability, right? Where, uh, you know, you really want to make a certain time window for a product release, right? And for a conventional design, um, it's actually really hard to do this from a ground, from a, from scratch hardware design, right? It's from a scratch hardware design, even today with a waterfall process, engineers are very appreciative of the fact that it's hard to know in advance for sure from, a, from scratch design, how long it's going to take. It's hard to really predict that exactly. Now, if you're an established company with an established product lines, such as a CPU, uh, you do know how long it's going to take. Um, but occasionally there is a hiccup, right? And occasionally a little bubble comes up and you get off your cycle. But the reason why you have more predictability in that case is because you have your design from last time, you're making kind of only, you know, medium to small size changes to it. And you can, you've done this medium, small revision process before, so you kind of have some data to go on. But with an agile process, right, if you're doing things correctly, you should have, you know, an MVP, a minimal and viable product, hopefully very early on, maybe very feature incomplete, but you can kind of see where you are and you can decide how long you're going to go through this, right? Maybe you decide, you know what, I'm satisfied with my performance at this point. I can stop design effort early right now, or I can keep going. And as you go over time, you can continue to improve your design, uh, continue to make it more robust and et cetera. And so these are kind of three main goals we're trying to get from using an agile hard design process. Cool. I'm going to pause here for questions for a second. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, I haven't said the word open source too much in today's talk, but you'll hear me say that a lot this quarter. So I want to kind of very clearly distinguish the two, right? So agile and open source are actually orthogonal concepts and dimensions, right? So agile is kind of this, you know, umbrella term for this rapid design process. Um, open source just means, you know, as the name implies, the code is freely available and usable, right? Um, and so what's interesting is these two are orthogonal, right? So you could do Agile with purely closed source, right? Closed source components, IP, as well as closed source tools, right? That's totally possible. Or you can take the open source IP that's out there and open source tools that are out there 
and you can do a water file style uh, design process. Also doable, right? And you can cross over various ways, right? And so the goal for this course is to get people excited about Agile. Because we're teaching, we're using open source. But doesn't mean that these concepts wouldn't apply with closed source IP or closed source tools. Um, right? And what's interesting is, um, despite them being orthogonal, there's still some convergence here, right? Or some intersectionality, so to speak, right? Uh, both agile approaches and open source approaches reduce hardware design costs, right? And so if hardware design costs are reduced, more folks can participate in hardware design, right? So those specialized designs that was happening up, you know, 15 minutes ago, now more entities can afford to make their specialized design, right? That's exciting, right? And if a wider number, a large number of designers doing a wider number of variety of things, hopefully that only just, that won't just increase the variety and, you know, diversity of hardware designs, but hopefully get some really creative, interesting things going on out there, right? And so uh, I do think, you know, it's one of these things where, you know, there's the clear, you know, near-term shift of, yes, going to, you know, agile approaches, open source approach uh, tools will, you know, have various effects. But I think there's some really interesting long-term potential impacts here where we can talk about by making, by lowering the bar to entry, we can now have more enter and thus get a much more diverse, excited, creative uh, community. So that's really why I'm so excited about this course. I'm so happy to teach this class for a second offering is, yeah, I'm really excited to try and grow the hardware design community rather than being just folks that, you know, took a zillion physics and EE courses and are, you know, Spreading out Verilog, I want this to be a very inclusive thing, especially bringing some of these software folks over and bring in their software skills to help make hard design even more flexible, more nimble, more exciting. Uh, and that's kind of really kind of motivation for me putting all this up together to create this course. And I think, uh, yeah, there's a really exciting time right now. We're having all this demand for all these, you know, new designs in this golden age of computer architecture. But at the same time, with this emergence and availability of high quality open source tools, as well as some of these new languages, we can really kind of put all these things together. Okay, so now coming back to the question from a student a few minutes ago is, uh, let's think about uh, for hardware design, right? So what would be the fastest hardware block I could develop? Well, it would be the one I don't have to actually write, right? It would be reuse, right? And so in software, reuse is standard, right? Uh, you can think of how someone could write in a pretty compelling web application if they're a talented programmer over a weekend. Uh, by leveraging this tons and tons of existing libraries and packages and frameworks. And really, it's their job to put them all together and kind of add their secret sauce, but they need to waste much time kind of doing the classic stuff everyone else has already done. Unfortunately, hardware isn't quite uh, as easily reusable, at least in this current form. Um, so as a result, uh, you know, companies have these internal libraries and components, and you'll see a lot of instances of very similar components. You wonder why, why there's so many instances. It turns out that there's subtle differences in the context or needs of this particular case. And due to the prior design processes, um, the hardware block was kind of, you know, right once, right? So it wasn't very flexible. It wasn't able to kind of adapt. It was the hardware block that met these constraints. And now on a different design, even you're solving a very similar problem, um, it's, not quite exactly the same, so you kind of need to redesign the whole block. And that's oof, so much effort, so much work. This is the number one thing we're trying to cut out with our Agile approaches is to not only get early feedback, but to figure out ways to get more reuse, right? Um, and to reuse something doesn't mean just the right thing, but it also needs to be correct, right? And when I say correct, doesn't mean it actually is correct. It also means uh, that you convince yourself or you convince your company is correct, right? And so you can see what the goal here, right? The goal is to have increased reuse, and that way you can spend more time on what is novel or unique to your design and less on writing things that have been written before, right? Spend less time reinventing the wheel. Um, and so how's the way we're gonna go about doing that and getting that reuse? It's something we call hardware generators, right? And so the issue is these prior components, like I said, they, they do most of what you want, but there's some subtle, small difference about what you want. Maybe the interface isn't quite what you want. Maybe performance isn't quite what you want. Um, so rather than having a single, you know, piece of concrete, like, you know, like a Verilog IP, what if it's something a little bit more flexible, right? So this generator uh, isn't just a single design instance. It's able to generate a design instance based on certain parameters, right? And, you know, how much can it change? Well, that depends on how complicated a generator is, right? You can imagine all sorts of types of generators, right? And I want to emphasize that generators aren't necessarily novel or new to this course, but uh, we are going to do some throughout, right? So for example, imagine right now, if you're in doing hardware design, 
there are generators you may use in a company you may not even appreciate as generators. For example, maybe you have a uh, on-chip memory compiler or perhaps a uh, interconnect generator, right? So that's going to, you know, go ahead and develop, you know, an Axie crossbar with some reports and certain specifications. And so how does that work? Well, internally, it probably has some high-level language, maybe Java, Python, or even Perl back in the day. And it's stitching together pieces of Verilog to um, create the thing you want, right? And it can be a little scary, a little dicey, and we'll talk about why that's um, problematic, but it is a generator, right? Somebody spent a lot of effort to build that generator, and now other groups in that organization can use that generator around to rewrite that component, right? Uh, and so generators are pretty cool, right? You can really kind of custom tailor what you want for design, and that's kind of a nice thing to do. Now, you can take that a step further, right? Where you have not just uh, a generator, but an open source generator. This is one of those places where open source can have a real impact, right? Where normally if you write IP, you write some hardware block, you know, some component, and you decide to open source it, that's great. The community really appreciate that. However, as I said, if you do the right thing, but it's not exactly the right thing, exactly the same way someone else wants it, they may not be able to reuse it, right? And it's one of these things where it's not just a concern about does it do the right thing, it's can you verify and test it? And once you start modifying and you kind of break that verification guarantee on it, and so people are kind of reluctant to touch that, right? And so all of a sudden now, if you go with an open source generator, I still need to verify the output, of course, but uh, hopefully it's more reusable and it's more useful to more people. And this is kind of an interesting threshold where by being a generator, it's more reusable to more people, it grows the community, that may grow the community to the point where all of a sudden there's enough critical mass to support this device, right? Where the best open source is not just a single organization contributing to it, but a community supporting and liking a certain device, a certain thing. And maybe a certain hard drive people block, if it was a single instance, maybe couldn't quite reach that critical mass, but now it's a generator and now it can be used in not just a single case, but all the related cases, has a larger community and thus more people can use it, right? And so with a larger community, you can have a better access to the kind of community-wide open source design efforts, and so that'd be really great to kind of spread it out that way. Uh, and so, yeah, so I think, as I said, the, the biggest issue to reuse currently is the notion that, you know, the thing you want is not quite exactly what you want, but it may be close, uh, and generous can really kind of help with that issue. Um, and one of the kind of key ideas I want to take away from this is to think of hardware generation, this kind of step, as another step in design flow. So rather than just, you know, RTL, Verilog goes into tool, and they get designed at the other end, before I generate RTL, I want to do hardware generation, right? And um, so rather than writing low-level RTL, make things like Verilog seem like assembly. You know, you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, it's just an interface to get to the next level of tools. Uh, and really kind of think of hardware generation as kind of step you're working on things. And so as you're seeing this course, thinking about hardware generators is kind of a little bit of a, at first a little bit more complicated, but then much more satisfying way to design hardware. Rather than thinking about how do I solve this problem today, it's also about what are kind of key fundamental underlying architectural structural things I'm trying to do here and how do I kind of make that in a very usable thing and taking agile philosophy, the way I'm going to coach you in this course is when you write a generator, the first time what you're going to do is you're actually going to make a single design instance, get the minimal viable thing running, and then you're going to keep adding on to it, right? So maybe in day one, it's completely fixed. Everything's fixed. And day two, maybe you go out and parameterize some components. Maybe day three, you go parameterize more components. You kind of keep making it more flexible, more nimble, et cetera. But, the goal is to have a generator, but as I said, maybe you can't build it all in day one. You can use an agile process to build your way up to all the sophistication, all that parameterization. Um, and hopefully this is, with this course, especially languages and techniques and tools we'll be covering, you'll feel kind of empowered to do this, right? So even if you are doing some hardware design, yes, it'll be great. Go off and make your own hardware design components. Uh, but even other classes, right? Instead of thinking things of, you know, I'm going to write this code, if it seems really tedious or manual to write something, and maybe something is a suggestion you should be automating it and um, working at a higher level. Okay, I'm going to pause again for questions for just a moment. Okay. Um, great. So what are we using in this course? Uh, we're using a language called Chisel, uh, which is actually an acronym for constructing hardware in a Scala embedded language. So there's quite a few uh, next generation hard design languages that have come out in the last you know few years. Uh, there's been decades of research of developing new hard design languages uh, and they've been kind of coming and going for a long time. Uh, I would qualitatively argue that 
Uh, Chisel is kind of part of this more recent generation, and amongst that more recent generation, Chisel's gone, uh, perhaps become the most uh, widespread or most mainstream, right? Where this was a university research project, uh, but since then it's you know now become fully open sourced. It's uh, been used by companies and actually available in consumer products. Um, just to briefly name drop some companies that have either seriously evaluated Chisel, contributed open source back to Chisel, or shipped products with Chisel. It doesn't include just companies like Sci5, uh, but also includes people like um, Google, IBM, and Intel, right? So uh, people definitely are kicking the tires on Chisel. Oh, Esperanto, of course. Sorry, I forgot them. Um, it's an exciting language. Now, can I promise this will be the only language people are writing in five, 10 years? No, no, I can't promise that. But what I can tell you is that this language is an ideal vehicle for this course, right? With this language, we can write really nimble, flexible uh, hardware generators. We can um, get through these agile concepts and you're gonna learn those agile concepts. And then, you know, whether it's Chisel or some language like Chisel that wins out, you'll be ready to use it, right? Um, and what's nice about Chisel is actually it's pretty fun to write. So uh, I know this last quarter I just taught the undergraduate Verilog course. And yes, you know, I've coached students through all the you know intricacies and annoyances of Verilog and all the ways the tools can not help you when they should be helping you and all the words and tactic quirks. It's painful, right? Um, and with Chisel, and especially, it's hopefully a lot more fun, right? So Chisel isn't a language from scratch. It's actually an embedded uh, DSL, domain-specific language. It's embedded in a language called Scala. So Scala is a high-level language built on top of Java. Uh, it's really nice. It has both uh, functional and object-oriented features that are really quite spiffy. Uh, and if you look at the more recent Java releases, a lot of the more recent Java versions have basically been trying to reproduce functionality of Scala to try and keep their users, right? So uh, if you compare Scala to Java and Scala was first made over 10 plus years ago, there's a big gap. And over the years, the gap has been slowly, slowly shrinking because these features in Scala have proven to be very valuable and very much liked by developers. Uh, but it's great. So for us, we'll be writing, technically we're writing Scala in Scala uh, as a language we're doing. And inside of Scala, Chisel is this kind of thing we're working with. And so technically it's actually a library in Scala. So you're, you're only writing Scala code. It just so happens that you're using a library for Chisel and you get hardware out the other end. Um, but there's some really nice features about this, right? So just a moment ago, I was talking about how sometimes industry people will, uh, you know, combine languages to make um, uh, generators, right? It's a standard practice. And then a lot of companies in certain components, they, you know, use Java to stitch together Verilog snippets. They use Perl to stitch together or Python to stitch together pieces of Verilog. And that can work. That two language approach is actually really problematic, right? Where uh, you can imagine where you're writing this and then, uh, you know, because you're spitting out strings and then passing that to something else later on, who knows if there's an error in there, right? It's kind of hard to trace things back. It's this huge mess. But having a single language to do this all at once uh, is really smooth, right? And perhaps a good way to think of this is that when you're writing a hardware generator in Chisel, taking advantage of all these spiffy features in Scala, in a way, it's like you're doing meta programming, right? You are uh, working another level. And so if you're very familiar with plus templates, you may have heard that meta programming term before. Uh, you can do that basically in hardware with you know, Chisel and Scala. I would argue it's syntactically a lot simpler than Swift plus uh, templates. Uh, and that's kind of the cool thing. And like I said, there's a lot of other uh, next generation hard design languages out there. Um, Chisel's the one that happens to be, I would argue, most mature, but the other ones are all out there and good. And it's, it's not unique in this features, right? If I, get, if I point to Chisel and ask you which features it have that's, you know, doesn't exist anywhere else, I can't do that. Or maybe just one small one I can't think of, right? But I mean, for example, you know, Chisel's inside Scala. There's actually another hard design language in Scala called Spinal, which was originally a fork of Chisel in the sense rewritten that core, right? But there's another one. Or I say, oh, Chisel's a hard design language in a functional program language. Actually, it's something called Haskell, which is about the same age as Chisel, written in, oh, sorry, Haskell, sorry, Clash, written in Haskell, right? Excuse me. Uh, so yeah, so there are a variety of other great uh, hardware re uh, language research efforts. There's a bunch in Python. You know, you have Magma, Perl, PyMetal. Um, and so it's a really exciting time for all these languages out there. But uh, there's a difference between, you know, really cool thing going on of one university versus getting other people to use it and getting companies to use it. And so Chisel's kind of crossed that threshold. Uh, doesn't mean they'll win for all time, but I think right now it's kind of the front runner and it's exciting. Um, so how are you going to be working within this course? We're actually going to be working with language in multiple different modalities, right? So uh, it can be compiled to JVM, to Java bytecodes. 
Uh, of course, we're also going to, you know, use it to generate hardware. There's also an interpreter, a REPL. Uh, so if you want to quickly kind of tweak things and play with things, you can do that. And we'll actually be using those REPLs inside Jupyter. Uh, you know, Jupyter Notebooks to get even more kind of quick, fast interaction with these things rather than wait for these long design processes. Whew. Okay, a lot going on. Um, oh yeah, one more detail to bring up. As I said Scala is kind of a fun language to write. Uh, one of the things I think they got really right in this language is their type system. So it's strongly and statically typed, meaning, you know, everything needs to have a type and you need to know that type at compile time. However, as a programmer, you aren't constantly writing types and everything because it has really good type inference. So the compiler is able to figure out what the type should be. And if it ever can't, that's when it tells you, hey, buddy, you got to give me a type. And so, yeah, okay, Whew, great. Um, questions so far? Okay, I'll keep going. Um, so throughout this course, there's kind of a lot of things going on, but I kind of wanted to highlight four themes that are, I'm going to keep repeating. You probably have already heard some of these things indirectly. Um, so for example, things like close the loop, right? You know, try to get through design process as quickly as you can um, in order to uh, see what the outcomes are and how you can go about changing and doing it a second time. Um, designing for reuse, right? The whole goal of increasing productivity is through productivity through reuse. So you want to figure out a way to get that productivity. Um, this other one's kind of continuing theme of make the tools do the work, right? Uh, avoid manual optimizations if you can, and really figure out ways to make the tools do the optimizations for you, right? Where um, if it's an optimization you hope to have accomplished and you recognize the tools are not doing it, figure out how you can change your design to encourage the tools to do it, right? Manual optimizations that are possible to be done by tools, that, that can be really a wasted effort because not only are you going to spend time doing things the tools could already do, but you're also going to make your source code more complicated and perhaps even prevent the optimization from being done by tools in the future, right? So really try to understand what tools can and can't do and to work with them, right? And that's kind of the whole goal for this course is we're going to figure out this kind of harmonious way to automate what's redundant, uh, automate what's tedious, and to really kind of work at a higher level to get more things done. And then this fourth theme, uh, design for readability. Um, it's important, right? So I'm sure you've all heard, you know, how... Uh, code is read much more often than it's written, right? You know, a single program may write it once, but it's going to be read many times by people trying to understand what it does, by people trying to revise and improve it. And so are there certain things you can do to make the code more understandable the first time it's read? I, I believe there are. And so throughout this course, you're going to see me go through code snippets live in lecture, and I'm going to kind of argue between different variants which one I, is more readable and what ways you can kind of make it less surprising and more understandable what's going on. Okay, so that's pictorially the kind of icons I'm going to try and reuse through the slides, but you can see here it is kind of written out more verbosely in the uh, notebook. But you see the kind of point here. The goal is we're trying to be agile, so we're going to close the loop, figure out a way to get reuse to get more productivity. So, for example, really get in those generators is going to be a way to get the reuse. Find a way to make the tools do the work. Rather than me having to write that module over and over again, use a generator to kind of tailor it to my custom instance. And yeah, what can I do to make things more readable? Readability is really, really important. It's not just a nice feature, but it's, it's really make you popular for coworkers and make your thing live on. Okay, so uh, now getting to the course logistics, maybe I'll pause, go back a slide if there's any questions about the kind of motivation or agile at first. Okay, so now going to the course logistics. So um, as you saw on the webpage and emails promoting this course, uh, there's kind of three main skill areas this course is putting together. And because they're so diverse, I don't expect everyone to have a strong background in all three simultaneously. If you do, that's fantastic. Uh, but uh, I, I would like to really make this course accessible to everyone else I can. So if you know only two or 1.5 of these out of three, you're in pretty good shape, right? So what are three areas? So there's actual hardware design, you know, doing things like Verilog or VHDL. Here at Santa Cruz, those are courses like, you know, CC 100L and 125L. Um, there's understanding how kind of these small blocks fit together at a larger scale. So computer architecture, things like, you know, 120 or 220 here at Santa Cruz. And then finally, kind of more programming experience, you know, familiar with object-oriented programming and functional programming. And so I am serious that if you feel comfortable with two out of three just concepts and the third one, you're like, I haven't taken a course in that or I don't feel super strong. I'm hoping to uh, really bridge that gap in this course, right? So for example, maybe you've 
or a software person took an architecture course, great. You're going to learn how to write hardware in a much more friendly, accessible way than using Verilog. Or maybe your person just has tons of hardware experience and maybe doesn't feel quite as comfortable with the programming. Cool. Um, we'll find a way. We'll, you'll learn how to think a little bit higher level, right? Um, and so, yeah, this is kind of the high level uh, file to prereqs. If you have questions, uh, you can speak with me uh, after lecture. I'll be staying on for impromptu office hours. But really, I want to make this class accessible, right? So if you're interested in this material, we'll find a way to make it work. I really want to broaden the community on this case. Um, and for, for example, some of you may be concerned, oh my gosh, you know, if I have seeking a career in a certain field, will my job be automated away? Well, the best way to avoid having your job automated away is to be the one doing the automation, right? So uh, don't be afraid to kind of put together all these things, make yourself a unique uh, set of talents, and take advantage of that. Okay, so... Who's teaching it? Well, you've heard me talk for almost an hour now, uh, so maybe I should have introduced myself properly in the beginning. Apologies. Uh, if you haven't taken a course from me already, my name is Scott Beamer. I'm an assistant professor here in the CSC department. Um, and yeah, uh, as you can see, my interests are not just only in open source hardware design, but architecture, graph processing, etc. cetera. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, Amog as our TA, uh, and he'll be a really great asset for this course. I'm really excited to have him as a TA. Uh, and so this course, uh, I think I mentioned that briefly, I'll mention it again. This is the second time we've offered the course. And so here we are kind of this agile approach where we've done it once and we were adapting on the fly. And now we're doing second time, trying to make it even better still. A lot of the course material you're seeing, uh, especially a lot of the assignments, was created by the prior TA, uh, Jason Vranick. So I'm going to give him a very big shout out because he's a big contributor to making this course happen originally. Cool. Um, so you can see your office hours is flipping our weekly schedule. But... If you have questions, I'll be sticking around on a Zoom call today to answer questions right away. Um, and yeah, we'll have weekly office hours for more questions beyond that. Okay, so how are we structuring this course? Well, not only is this course fun because the material is fun, it's also fun because it's an elective grad course, right? So let's have fun with this, right? So um, because it's an elective grad course, I'm choosing not to have exams, right? I'd rather we just focus on the hardware and I don't know what a timed hardware design exam would be like, right? So um, we're trying to make this kind of fun, engaging and going through it. So what are the main things we're doing in this course? Well, we have these lectures. Uh, you know, right now we're remote. Hopefully we'll be in person in two weeks. Um, but then in terms of course assignments, there's three main categories, right? Uh, there's labs, homeworks, and projects. But perhaps it's better to think of this more as uh, two halves of this course. They're really more like the first two thirds and the last third. So the first two thirds is what I call the structured portion of this course. And so, yeah, you're going to see me give lectures. Uh, there's going to be assignments, you know, labs and homeworks. It's going to feel like a pretty structured course, right? You know, like a regular course where you kind of have very clear materials and very clear outcomes. And then the final third of this course, we're going to shift gears, right? And at that point, we're going to uh, do a project uh, it's a project of your own design by uh, working with a partner and you're going to, you'll get a chance to kind of have more self-guided learning and kind of learn a lot from the experience to kind of integrate what you've learned. And then the lectures will kind of turn a little bit more um, open-ended. We'll get some guest lectures coming in and that'll be kind of like that. And as you can see, you know, this course is embracing the agile philosophy. So this is the plan today. You know, if we see along the way how to improve things, there's something wrong or just to make a way to make it better, we will change along the way and totally embrace that Agile philosophy as we go through this. Cool. Um, maybe I'll kind of clarify some of these uh, things in a little bit more detail, but feel free to stop if you have questions along the way. So uh, as you can see, our lectures are Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9.20 at 10.25 a.m. We have a room allocated on campus. I would love to go see it if it's a safe thing to do for all of us. Um, but either way, I will be recording the talks to put them on YouTube. I mean, this course uses a lot of open source tools. So I'm happy to to release all the content for this course to open source to whoever else in the future wants to watch this course. Already, for the last offering, I got a variety of thank you emails from people around the world, so I'm happy to put it out there and keep putting it out there. This is fun to get out there. I'm not aware of too many uh, other academic uh, agile open uh, agile hardware design courses, so it's kind of fun to have this unique opportunity in Santa Cruz to kind of put these things together and get it out there. So yes, so here we are via Zoom the first two weeks. Hopefully, it makes sense for us to come back in person. We'll see. Um, we have a room allocated. And so the way I have the lecture set up right now is that uh, I'm recording straight for myself, uh, not including the Zoom, so you folks are all uh, wonderfully uh, anonymized. You might hear pauses in recordings. Uh, when we're in person, I'll figure out a way to do a similar thing, and I'll, I'll, I'll cross the bridge when we get there. 
Um, but because of that, because you're not being recorded in the Zoom, don't be afraid to you know turn on your webcam, get to know your classmates, see a little bit of chat. That's great. Uh, make a community. Um, this is a small uh, grad course. Let's you know be friends. Uh, and then um, one other detail is these these lectures are actually Jupyter notebooks. So you know uh, yeah, you can go ahead and you know modify. You know uh, I can go ahead and you know take notes in line. So today, because the first lecture, you guys didn't know about it, but uh, if you go to the webpage, it'll be updated after this lecture. You can see GitHub repos, including GitHub uh, for these Jupyter Notebooks. If you want to go ahead and download these notebooks and play with them locally while I'm giving a lecture, you can run the code I'm running. You can tweak it, take notes in line, etc. So it's kind of fun. Uh, so that'll be kind of a nice thing to have. Uh, and then if we keep going, well, so what about these labs? These labs are also going to be Jupyter Notebook based. So we can kind of really get a quick sample of like, this week we covered these few language features, these few hardware concepts. With the labs, you can do really brief kind of tests, right? Round to run all this boilerplate code and this giant assignment, wrap your head around a really long spec. Just, you know, short, you know, fill in these three lines in the browser and see how something works, right? Um, so it's kind of fun, the kind of easy way to kind of get your first contact with material and kind of get going. Um, and the idea is, you know, as soon as you feel like you know enough the material to get the lab done, you know, hopefully it takes you not too long. Uh, if you need to work with a buddy, that's okay. Uh, you need to submit your own code, but it's okay to collaborate if your classmates on these, you know, just kind of get through it. Um, and then you move on to the homework, right? So the homework is probably going to spend the most time out of class in this uh, course. Uh, so they're more substantial design. So rather than just being you know, a couple of lines in Jupyter, no, they're going to be a full-on chisel project. Um, and But we'll be giving you a lot of scaffolding and code and usually a repo you can clone and start from. And you're going to submit these via grade scope. We're going to auto-grade it. We'll give you some test cases. You're probably going to want to write more test cases on your own. Um, this is probably the majority of the work. And yeah, we're happy to help you on these things. Uh, please seek out the staff for help. These are already be done individually, but we're hoping to really get a good community going where if you ask questions in a sufficiently abstract manner, it's okay to ask for a lot of help uh, to your classmates. And we as staff love office hours and such. You want to come talk to us. In terms of lateness, because we're not releasing solutions or anything, it's okay for these to be a little bit late. So the way I'm kind of putting a limit on that is you get what we call three slip days. So um, yeah, no penalty. Uh, how it works is, you know, so these are integer, meaning, you know, um, if you turn an assignment one hour late, you actually have another 23 hours to, uh, if you want to further improve it, that's one slip day. But yeah, no point consequence or anything. It's just, uh, there you have it. Why do we have only three rather than 20 slip days? We don't want people to get too far behind, um, but hopefully three is a good amount where if you know something comes up, uh, it'll be okay. Uh, if something else comes up beyond that and you need to talk to me, feel free to do so. And then as I said, there's going to be a project uh, and you actually can go ahead and peek at a web page from last time to see the students last time around what they've done. And it's kind of fun, right? Where you can uh, integrate everything you've learned. So we're going to kind of be learning various things about hardware design, various things about Chisel, various things about Scala, various things about agile processes. You can put them all together to build your own generator, right? And it doesn't need to be super huge, right? Um, but it'll be kind of fun. You can have your own generator, and uh, although not required, we encourage you to uh, open source it and put it out there in the world, right? So that's kind of fun. Um, and of course, because it's a project, you'll go ahead and uh, not just write some code, but also give a brief presentation to your classmates. As you can see, the class is not super large, so we have time to have presentations from each other. Uh, question, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So the question was, can I get an example for the project? And so, uh, yes, uh, a good example would be thinking of things that have some amount of parameterizability. We want you to have a generator. Uh, and so an example of things from last year, last year our homework assignments were very commonly ciphers, like from, from cryptography. So a lot of student projects kind of were in that same direction. One of the big changes I'm making this year is I'm going to reduce the amount of ciphers in the homework. <laughs> and we'll see if we get a different uh, variety of the hardware. Um, so if you give me a second, I'm clicking around, I'm going to go to last year's webpage and read off the project students did so I can tell you what they uh, were. Um, so uh, last year we had someone do a 4G cipher, one to block and sign out the entire thing. Uh, MIMC is another hash generator used in some of these other crypto algorithms. A funnel shifter, a 
neural net generator written in Chisel is pretty cool. It can take in like uh, some details for some neural net layers and actually generate the hardware and wire all together and that kind of stuff. And then something else, also in crypto space, uh, a Merkle tree generator using Poseidon hashes. So that was kind of cool. So these, you can imagine these are blocks that you can kind of fit into larger designs. No, they aren't a full processor. Uh, yes, in my prior lives, I've you know made RISC five cores, spent a lot of time in RISC five cores. Uh, this course is not about making RISC five cores, even though I'd love to do that. Um, the reason why is that uh, we can get to a lot of these hard design concepts and challenges without having to go through all the complexity of having to think about the architectural needs of uh, ISAs, right? So. Uh, you know, even though um, that'd be really fun, and there is room for parameterizability in the CPU core, uh, we can get a lot of kind of cool concepts across without kind of go in that direction. So as a result, we're actually not going to do cores. We're going to be building kind of harder blocks for various purposes. Um, great question. Uh, I see a second question. Yes, yes, great question. So the question is whether there exists for a community. So for this course, there's a Slack uh, I set up. Um, I opted not to go Piazza because I think the Slack, if you know the size of this course, they can get the job done. Um, I like Piazza personally, but I, I think, yeah, we'll have Slack. So there'll be multiple channels. Feel free to uh, post there, ask questions there, etc. I think that's maybe a good segue to go to the next slide. I think it actually has that mentioned. Yes. Yeah, so this is good for everyone on the recording as well. As I said, this course makes heavy use of open source components, so we're trying to open source everything we can. So these lectures, these assignments, yeah, they're all open source out there. We encourage students to open source their projects. Um, and so all this is on the public website. And yeah, this is all out there, open to all. Uh, and that's where we're going to keep the majority of the stuff, right? We do have an internal web page. Uh, it's referred to as Canvas on our Canvas, our internal course manager system. Um, and, uh, what's there? Well, really it's just the things we don't want to put in public internet. So things like the zoom links for these first few lectures, as well as the link to our Slack. Um, but for students, you probably won't need to go to canvas too often. Uh, you only submit assignments. So we using something called grade scope, which you can get to through canvas. But other than that, I don't think there'll be too much need to use the canvas. Really, you should be able to get most of the content you need from the public website. Um, and, uh, of course, we're getting help, you know, and the Slack is a great way to get access to both myself and the TA as well as other classmates. Uh, cool. Other questions? Yes. So I can't speak for students in the course, but historically this course via petition has satisfied that requirement. Um, I would be happy to course support such a petition. I believe it, you know, in my mind, it's kind of somewhere under the hardware and systems umbrella. So I think it's a useful course and it's, it's a meaty course, right? There is, there are assignments, there are, you know, deliverables. Um, this isn't just a seminar, right? And so, yeah, I, I would think that's the case, although I can't, you know, make promises for the grad division. <laughs> and so... Yeah, it's a great thing to confirm with them. And yeah, please do share what you find and let me know how I can support that up, uh, how I can support that. Okay, so we're just about out of time, but I actually have two more slides I want to get through very quickly. If you need to sign off, this will be on YouTube. Um, so what do you get out of this course? There are two types of things you're gonna learn. There are the concrete things that are very tangible and, con you know, uh, so hopefully you're gonna learn how to write this language chisel. And as you see from this project, right, you'll be kind of comfortable going off and designing a generator, right? Deciding, you know what, I want to build a generator that does X, Y, and Z. And you can't do it overnight, but you'll be able to kind of build your way through it and, you know, incrementally using agile techniques, build your way up to building something that's pretty cool, right? And as you kind of keep working on it, keep optimizing it, adding more features, et cetera, et cetera. And so to kind of do all that, yes, you'll need to learn these languages, some of these tool flows. We're going to cover some open source processes in this course, you know, how to do uh, continuous integration, code reviews, even some verification tricks. Uh, we're excited this quarter to add in some of the new chisel form of verification stuff. So that's really exciting. Um, those are the concrete tangibles, right? Takeaways from this course. What are the more meta skills that hopefully, you know, even if you don't write chisel ever again, what would you remember 10 years from now? Uh, hopefully I can sell you on this agile philosophy, right? 
of kind of continuous improvement, and continuously revising, continuously doing things. And you use a lot already and you don't even realize it, right? For example, you're writing like a, a paper or, you know, like something like that. You may have an outline in the beginning, but usually you end up having to revise and rewrite it tremendously, right? I, I can't know. I don't know if too many authors able to outline so well the first time that once they just write it, it's done, right? No, they have to write it, see how things fit together, see what's missing, revise it, get feedback, improve. So this agile approach, we've been doing in a lot of places throughout time. It's just recognizing you take this style to hardware, right? And so hopefully, you know, through the course of, you know, the project in this course, you'll get, you know, more experience evolving idea from your first inkling to what's the final outcome. And uh, hopefully you recognize, you know, more places to take this agile philosophy on the road, right? Where else can you use it? Not just for hardware design, but maybe something else you're doing. You know what? If I did this kind of more incrementally, more adaptively, I can kind of learn a lot from it. Cool. Uh, any last questions I should answer while we're still being recorded? Okay, well, with that, I will wish you all a good day. I'll be staying on. I'm just stopping the recording officially.